Hello? Perfect. Thank you, Joel. Um, and thank you, Shopify, for having me here. Really, really, really pleased and excited to be here in Bangalore. So yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about building a web agency, uh, specifically telling you a bit about the story of we make websites, how we got started, and how, how we've grown. So in 2007, I found myself working at Merrill Lynch, which, for those of you who don't know, is a big investment bank. I just graduated from university, uh, went onto their graduate scheme, thought it was a good place to work, seemed like it was an exciting place to work, lots of interesting technologies, I thought I could start there and really make a difference. Sadly, the reality of that career was quite a lot different, and I really, really didn't like being there, I couldn't make any change, I couldn't, I'd, it just didn't match up to my expectations. One of the good things about working there was I made a lot of good friends. You joined as a big graduate group, and one of the people I met was this gentleman here with the fantastic hair on the left. Um, and this was, in, in fact, the first day we met, um, just going out for a drink. And we quickly bonded over a sort of shared uh, dislike for our job, if you like. Um, neither of us really wanted to be there. Um, and we were trying to hatch a plan to escape. Um, so this is us working away um, in a, evenings and weekends. This is in my old flat. Um, and the first thing we did was try and create an iPhone app. And it was an iPhone app to help you find bars that were still open near you. Didn't work, but I thought it was a good idea. Next thing we did was create a project management tool. Again, didn't work, but we were learning a lot. Still working at Merrill Lynch this whole time. And then one day someone asked us to make a website. And we hadn't really thought about having a web agency, but we said yes, thought it'd be interesting to try, try and do. Um, and this is it, this is our first website. Um, and it was built on Drupal, um, horrible platform for those of you that had the pleasure. Um, and yeah, we, we made this website, we got paid for it, I did the branding and the design, Alex did the, the actual build of it, and it was really thrilling to get paid for something, like for building something like this um, outside of a, a job. Um, so we decided to, yeah, let's create a web agency. So the next weekend, we came up with a name, we uh, registered the company and built this, our first uh, agency website, which as you can see is pretty dreadful, but it was, it was good, it did the trick. Um, and eight years later, um, we're now uh, totally focused on Shopify, um, particularly Shopify Plus, um, and we're the UK's leading Shopify agency, um, and one of the biggest agencies in the world on Shopify platform. And we're a team of 25 people in London. Uh, here's some photos of our lovely team. Very nice. Oh no, stuck. There I am. And these are some of our clients. These are uh, some uh, fashion brands that we work with. Um, all Shopify Plus clients. This is a fairly new launch of ours. Mavi Jeans, really big company. I think they're based in Turkey originally. Um, but we just launched the US and the Canadian store for these guys. And this is Skinny Dip. They're quite commonly used and shown on the Shopify website. Um, bit of a poster boy for the Shopify world. Um, they've grown up on Shopify. Their brand's exploding at the moment. They use POS and they're on Plus. And so they're the kind of things we're working on. So that's a bit of background about me, and I'll be talking more about our story in a minute as I get into the meat of our talk, um, which is really about tips and advice on starting and growing an agency. Specifically, I'm going to talk about three things that we've done that I think have really helped us grow and been sort of instrumental in our success. So number one, specialization. And by specialization, I mean having a niche or a focus. Before I get into that, I'll tell you how to do it wrong or what we did, which was wrong or didn't work. Um, so rewinding back to 2010, uh, this is the point we just about quit our jobs, I think. Um, so we'd left Merrill Lynch and we're going all out. Again, website not so great. Welcome to our website, by the way, is not a good headline for a website. <laughs> 2011, this, this is getting slightly better now. Uh, we didn't really have a focus still, still just making any old website. We make websites so you don't have to. A little bit better. <laughs> this one sort of got rid of headlines or anything like that, just started talking about clients. But at this point in time, we fancied ourselves as a bit of a design studio. Um, but it was still just the two of us. 
we were going nowhere fast. We didn't have any kind of focus. We didn't know how to market ourselves. And I think a lot of agencies find themselves in this position. Our strategy was, we'll do anything, basically. We'll make you any type of website. And it, was, it was, went beyond that as well. We did branding and SEO, digital marketing, all sorts of stuff. Um, so one week, I'd be working on building an architectural website. The next week, I'd be working on building a not-for-profit website with event bookings and event management, all that sort of stuff. The next week, we'd be working on a CRM system to manage adverts on the tube. And we were just all over the place. And it was very, very stressful. You go into a sales meeting, and because you didn't have any focus on any particular type of client or type of business, you'd be blagging it the whole time. I'd go into a sales meeting with, say, a law firm, having never built a law firm website before, not knowing anything about what they needed. And it was really, really difficult. And then when you actually won the client, you've then got to work out what it is they need, and you've never done it before. You may be working on a platform you've never built before. So we didn't really have any kind of specialization. So it's super stressful. So my advice is it's much better to specialize. Um, and this is what we did. So we decided um, it wasn't working. We weren't growing. Still just the two of us. Making money enough to pay ourselves, but we weren't really a company. We weren't really an agency. So we decided to specialize on a few different things. So first was London-based e-commerce startups. London, because we were in London. E-commerce, because we thought it was the most interesting area for us. Startups, because we kind of were one and we knew a load of startups. Um, design focused. Um, the aesthetic of what we were creating led it, lent itself very much to fashion. And they were the kind of websites we were building that people really liked and shared. So there wasn't much more to our thought process than that, um, except we wanted a niche. Fashion and homewares was, was the thing. And then Shopify, so clients that wanted to sell on Shopify and already heard about Shopify. So that was a really big part of our niche. We wanted to focus on a single platform instead of jumping about from Magento to Squarespace to Drupal to WordPress to whatever. Um, so that was our niche, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so what were some of the benefits of this? So we'd gone from having no plan at all and making you know, websites for all sorts of people right down to this tiny little niche. And the first benefit was being seen as an expert. Now, because I was working with London-based fashion e-commerce retailers all the time, every time I went into a sales meeting, I knew what they were talking about. I knew their business. They all had the same problems. They were all asking me the same questions, and I always had the answer because they'd, I'd been asked it so many times before. So that was really, really good for building trust. Because um, if you're giving them advice already in your first meeting, and giving them useful information, answering all of their questions, they immediately start trusting you, which is really important to getting that sale. Also helps you stand out from the crowd. When you were, uh, before, when we were just a web agency that did any and every website, you're really the only way of differentiating yourself is saying, right, we are better development than these people, or we are better at design than these people. Um, and that is not a good way to differenti differentiate yourself, because Clients can't really see that, they don't really know, and everyone's trying to differentiate themselves on those things. So instead, we differentiate ourselves by saying, look, we are good at this stuff, we are good at design, we are good at development, but we are good at it for your specific business. You know, we are focused entirely on this fashion, e-commerce, startups in London world, um, so we're going to be able to help you way more than in this generic agency that doesn't know anything about your business. And it also focused our marketing. We were able to put what little time and resources we had into a much smaller, smaller field. So we, instead of trying to shout to everyone saying, oh, we, we'll develop your website, we were going to fashion events and speaking to people um, at startup meetups and all that sort of stuff. And we could market ourselves much more effectively. And I'm going to talk a lot more about marketing in the second part of my presentation. But in short, we just became more compelling. If you landed on our website and you were in our niche, it was very obvious to you that we were the right people to use. And I want to is illustrate that with another example. So imagine you run a web agency. Maybe some of you do. Hopefully some of you do. Uh, and you're looking for an accountant. Which one of the following is more compelling? So this, this is Glazers, a fairly well-respected accountant in London for small business. Um, they do all the stuff you need an accountant to do. Tax, um, auditing. Uh, payroll, all that sort of stuff. And that's kind of what it says on here. Um, it's fine. I'm sure they're very good. 
Not particularly compelling for me when I landed on this site. Compare that with these guys. They're an accountancy firm. They probably do exactly the same stuff behind the scenes, but their sole focus is digital agencies. So me as a web agency landing on here, I'm immediately drawn in. I feel like, right, these are the guys for me. And all of their content is about that. All of their blog is it's not just about accountancy for web agencies. It's other interesting stuff. They like produce reports, benchmarking digital agencies. It's really, really compelling. And it made me immediately think, right, these are the guys for me. So if you've got a really strong niche, your website should almost be off-putting to people outside it. When people land on our website and they're not in our niche, i.e. they're not looking for a Shopify developer, uh, a designer developer in the fashion space, they're probably going to be put off. We're not the right people for them. But that does mean the flip side is also true. If you are in the niche, it's super compelling and people will want to work with you. So how do you choose a niche? Um, one of the important thing to do is probably focus on business size or scale. We initially focused on startups. That is not the case now, by the way, but that is, was our initial focus. But you could decide to focus on startups, enterprise. You could say, right, I'm interested in businesses in the 1 to 10 million turnover range. It's good to have an idea of your target. Then on top of that, you could have a, a vertical. So we focus on fashion. It could be anything. You could focus on health, you know, health and fitness or something like that. The good thing there is you get to learn that, bit, that area of the business. When my fashion clients speak to me, I know everything about what they need to know. So they're not just asking me about their website. They're asking me about fulfillment, returns management, materials management, um, yeah, all, all that other st stuff that's outside of what we would typically be advising. And again, that builds trust. If you don't want to do that, you could have a super niche um, service offering. So these guys, I'm sure everyone in the room has probably heard of. Carson, all they do is tiny little tweaks. So if you want a, a website from them, they're not going to give you that. They're just going to give you tiny tweaks, incredibly well-defined. And if you want that, it's perfect. If you don't, like I said, you're going to be off-put by it. But, but it's, it's perfect. You know, they're one of the biggest shopper experts out there in terms of number of clients. It's working incredibly well for them, that strategy. So if you're thinking about starting a niche, and hopefully I, I'm convincing you of that fact, Here's some questions to ask yourself. So number one is who values what you do? Now, if I think about how we chose our niche, we'd been working with all sorts of different types of businesses. So law firms, uh, not-for-profits, architecture firms, etc. cetera. Um, we'd done a lot of e-commerce as well. And the thing with the e-commerce businesses is they really valued what we did more because I could show them the return on investment much more easily. I could say, right, we changed this product page which increased your ad to cart rate, which increased your overall conversion rate, which increased your profit. Um, so that was the people that valued what we did, which is why we chose to focus there. What audience do you have? Now for this, um, we, because we were a startup and we were going to a lot of startup events, we decided that of all the audiences, startups were the one we had a little bit of reach with. We didn't have a big audience, and I'll talk about growing an audience later, but at least we had something there. And then finally, what services can you offer? So we'd been doing branding and digital marketing and all sorts. Um, but we really thought the thing we are good at is the design development of websites. So let's bring it all back to that and, and cut, cut away all of the fat. Um, the answers to, your question, to these questions for you guys will probably be very different. But I think they're a useful set of questions when, when choosing that niche. So hopefully now I'll convince you that it's good to have a niche. Next up, how to market to them. So what we did was content marketing. And this has been incredibly instrumental in, our, in, in the growth of our company. It's probably the biggest thing we've done. Um, and to, to sort of start off on this approach, um, it's really important to understand your audience. So we'd identified our niche. We had some clients already in that niche. Um, and we spoke to them. So this is one of our clients, our first e-commerce client, Snowden Flood, homewares uh, designer. These guys are a fashion company, a lingerie company, incredibly successful now, at the time a startup. Um, these guys were a sort of fashionable food company, slightly outside our niche, but still an, er an early stage startup uh, that was based in London. And we talked to these guys, and we found that they kept asking us the same questions. They kept asking us for advice on you know, fulfillment and when to send email marketing, SEO, 
how to photograph products, all that sort of stuff. So we thought, let's just start answering these questions. So we started a blog. It didn't look like this at the time, but this is our blog now. Hasn't really changed. The content sort of angles changed a bit. But the type of stuff we were writing about was this kind of thing. So seven e-commerce mistakes you can avoid, how to engage people on Instagram, what to do on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all this sort of stuff. We were answering the questions that we were being asked in the hope that people are searching for these questions and they'd end up landing on our website, reading an article, signing up to get some sort of freebie so we were capturing their email address, then email marketing to them, pushing out this content the whole time, then pushing it out on social, they'd end up following us there. Um, and it really, really worked for us. We, I'd say probably about two months after starting doing this, the number of inquiries we were getting doubled and it's just continued to skyrocket from there. We're now getting 60,000 uniques a month on our website, which for a B2B business of our size is pretty great. Um, we've got 16,000 people reading our um, email mailing, mailing list. Um, and yeah, it doesn't just stop at your blog, though. This, that's just the first part, part for us. That's the kind of um, initial starting point. Obviously, you're pushing all this stuff out on social as well. But beyond that, we also run the London Shopify meetup. And the strategy here is exactly the same. We give out free advice. People come to listen to it. They find it useful. Um, they start to trust us. And eventually, they inquire. Um, so London Meetup's been great for us. We also do a lot of speaking engagements. This is my partner, Alex, um, in modern form. Less hair, more beard. Um, this is him talking at uh, a fashion event. So this is a fashion event. And it was a room full of people starting up fashion companies. So absolutely perfect for our niche. Um, pushing the same content out on YouTube. This hasn't worked so well for us, um, but I think it really could, do, could work well if we put a bit more effort into it. So it's repackaging the same content, pushing it out there. Um, conferences, attending these, speaking to people, same advice-based approach, using our content. Um, if you get a stand-up one of these, it's often a leg up to get a speaking gig as well. So that's useful. And then this is something we tried recently, which is not content marketing, um, but it is linked. We did a, uh, yeah, we put up a massive poster in London, basically. Um, and as a piece of content marketing, we then took photographs of it, did a write-up on our blog, um, talked about it a lot on Twitter, got picked up by a Shopify team, shared internally in Shopify, so bought, bought us a good bit of uh, goodwill there. Um, and yeah, it was an interesting bit of content, really. So it's it experimenting with these things um, to see what works, which leads me on to this great quote that I like from John Wanamaker, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And it's, it's kind of, the point is basically you need to experiment. But if you are going to experiment, you need to measure to see what is working. So at the point of experimentation, you might think, right, putting up a big poster in London could be a total waste of money. Um, so I need to measure what, what return I'm going to get on that. Um, and we measure everything. We measure all of our content output. So we measure the volume of what we're putting out there. We measure our search engine ranking positions. We measure article engagement, how much, people, how much time people are spending reading our blog posts, where they're going afterwards. Are they signing up to our mailing list? Are they inquiring? Um, so all of our conversions. And then we learn from this and refocus. So every month, we're in Google Analytics, all sitting there in a meeting going through, right, we wrote this post on writing a website specification. That got really great traction. How can we write something different that's going to help us again? Um, and we'll also look at stuff that was, didn't work so well. So we wrote this post on something else. No one read it. No one cares. Let's not do that again. And it's re really worked well. And, and, and over time, this has refined all of our content. So we're now a bit of a content marketing machine. Finally, does it result in sales? The other thing you've got to track is when you actually make a sale, Make sure you speak to your clients and ask how they found you, because it's often from a number of different touch points. Typically, in our case, they'll have read something on our blog, they'll have come to one of our events, they've followed us on Twitter, um, or maybe a few other touch points before they inquired. And we track all of that in our CRM, so we know where all of these people are coming from, and that helps us, refocus, that helps us focus our marketing some more. So yeah, that was content marketing. That's been really big for us. Um, so now you've got a niche. You've got all of these inquiries coming because your content marketing is so good. So your top of your sales funnel is big. Uh, now you need to make sure you can sell to these people. So 
Oh, yeah, that's what I just said. Um, so what we did originally was not very good, um, similar to when we started out in the business. Yeah, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, so we were doing things uh, like just using an inbox to track our leads. We didn't have any process for following up. We were not sharing the status of the leads in the team. Um, we went after every possible lead with sort of equal vigor. Um, we had no focus. We used to write bespoke proposals for every single lead, uh, literally writing out a Word document, turning it into a PDF and sending. Um, we were focused on selling to new clients only, kind of not thinking about selling to existing clients. So these were all the kind of things we were doing wrong. So don't do that. Um, here's what I would suggest you do. So if you haven't already, get yourself a CRM. HubSpot is a great one. We don't use it, um, but I know it's a really good one. We use our own um, system because for a number of reasons, it's sort of grown into that over time. But really, what you need to make sure your CRM is doing is having, getting all your leads in there, making sure you know the status of them. So new leads, leads you've contacted, leads you've sent proposals to, leads you've met, leads you're close, close to selling, leads you've actually closed. I'd assign values to each of those leads at sort of minimum so you know which ones to focus on. And then you should be junking your leads. So you should be qualifying all of these leads that are coming in. So we use some qualifying questions. Now, these will probably be very different depending on the businesses you're focusing on, but some of them are fairly universal. So what's the client's budget? When we started out in the Shopify space, we had fixed costs uh, or the yeah, advertised fixed pricing because the projects weren't that complicated. So this was less of a problem, but now this is really key for us. If the enterprise clients we're going after now don't know their budget, that has a massive red flag. What are their timescales? Are they realistic? Do they, um, are you going to be able to match them? Um, what integrations are required? Now, this one is useful for us because, again, it qualifies the quality of a client. If they're using an ERP like NetSuite or Microsoft Dynamics Nav, you can tell they're investing in their business elsewhere, and they're likely to be, for us now, a Shopify Plus client, which is what we're after. Um, what third parties are involved? This is a good measure of complexity. So how complex is this project going to be? And does that tie up to their budget? Does it tie up to their timescales? And there are loads more qualifying questions. And depending on your niche and depending on your focus, you'll have a different set. But it's really important to have a set of qualifying questions. The aim being to filter out the good leads so you can focus on them and just get rid of all the junk. Because if your content marketing is effective, you're going to get loads of inquiries. And frankly, you know, 80% of them are probably going to be not the stuff you, you want or they're going to be lower value stuff you don't want to concentrate on. Use a proposal system. So this was a big turning point for us. Um, and it was possible because we had a niche. So prior to this, we were doing everything bespoke, writing bespoke proposals for everyone. As soon as we had this quite narrow niche, we found we could pretty much automate our proposal system. So someone would fill in our inquiry form. That would come into our system. I could literally hit a button. It would create a proposal that was 95% complete. I'd then write a little bit of spiel at the top of it about their particular business, maybe add in a few optional extras, and send it back to them. And what this meant was we could turn proposals around in a fraction of the time of our competitors. So whilst, they, whilst someone might be waiting for a proposal for a week from someone else, they had it in a number of hours from us, which often closed deals before the competitors even had the chance to get in there. So that was really big for us, um, and we still do it to this day. It, our proposal system grows. I mean, we built our own, but there are loads, of loads out there that will allow you to have standardized blocks of content that you can just drop in really quickly, um, make it look really bespoke and still a very high-quality proposal, but your, so your clients would be happy with it, but actually the time taken to create it is super short. Um, so yeah, standardize your proposals, automate them if you can, um, and it only really works if you've got a niche. Um, so then... My final point is to talk about the, sale, the, the rest of the sales process. So once you've made a sale and you've got a client, your sales process doesn't end. Um, you've got to keep these clients, and you've got to keep selling to them. This is another good stat I like from marketing metrics. You've got a 60 to 70% chance of selling to an existing customer compared to a probability of selling to a new prospect at only 5 to 20%. So don't put all of your effort into selling to new customers, new customers, new customers. Put a lot of your sales focus into selling in, into existing customers. Um, and you'll have a much easier time of generating revenue then. So the way to do that for an agency is retainers, so you know, getting people paying for something on an ongoing basis, or ongoing services, really. Um, so 
we make sure that's a big part of our process. When people sign up with us, we're telling them that once their website's built, it's not finished. You know, they're going to need to optimize it. They're going to need to enhance it and get new features over time. So we're selling in the idea of a retainer right at the start. Um, and he here are some of the benefits. So I talked about the higher chance of conversion. Much easier to convert an existing client to sell um, than, than a new client. The sales sh cycle shorter because you don't need to sell them on who you are and why you're good. You've already done something for them. They're really happy with it, hopefully. Uh, they love what you've done. So then you're just um, selling in something else to them. There are no onboarding costs. They already know you. They know your systems. You don't have to introduce them to your team. Um, and the biggest benefit by far is predictable revenue. So all agencies struggle with this problem of no sales this month, five sales this month, and a really spiky sales um, sort of graph. Retainers and ongoing services help level that out so you can predict a bit more where your revenue is going. So I can see in six months, I think we'll be up here based on this, this line graph. Um, so I know I can hire more people. Um, I can invest more in marketing. I can invest more in office space or whatever it is. Um, so it allows you to grow. So having these retainer clients or these ongoing clients is what allows you to grow as an agency. And as an agency, your, your, your client list or your retained client list is your value. So if you're ever thinking about selling your agency, if that's your end goal, you need all of these retainers um, because that's the thing that people are going to value. Um, so my parting piece of, last piece of advice is work as hard to keep a customer as you do to find a new one. And that's it. Thanks for listening. I hope that's been useful.